Good Wednesday morning. Thank you for taking some time out of your day for our midweek session of the Preterist Power Hour. Uh, we don't normally go live on Wednesdays. However, I love to mark out Wednesday as a Wisdom Wednesday. And I trust what we bring forth this morning uh, will be very beneficial in providing wisdom to you regarding our fall back to Genesis. We've been uh, looking at Genesis 1. We began some precipitory thoughts on Monday. Uh, we outlined basically Genesis 1 through 2. We highlighted some hermeneutical important things, which we've, you know, belabored in my opinion. I think the, uh, the you know, the covenant creation community for that matter, we've talked a lot about the hermeneutics. However, I, I haven't seen as much of getting into the text. So for me, that's really what I've been endeavoring toward uh, as we're falling back to Genesis is just bringing us, we need to talk about hermeneutics. Let's, let's highlight that. We need to uh, highlight healthy ways of reading the scriptures. However, we also need to read the scriptures. So I pray that this morning, our time will be very beneficial to you in that regard. You'll re review the different things that we've already said, uh, namely all of that, the hermeneutical information and in Genesis one through two. And today we'll be journeying further from, let's say uh, verse three to 13. And uh, that'll be our goal for today, days one through three. And uh, I believe we will be very much blessed. This is the Preterist Power Hour. In case you didn't know what you were just tuned into on Facebook or wherever you're tuned in, I do thank those, of course, that are here with me in our live session. Uh, thank you for being here. This is our hour of power. We generally do this every Monday and Friday at 10.30 a.m. Eastern. However, this week, again, we took the liberty to go live here for Wednesday, uh, and we also take liberties to go live for different interviews if the times don't work for uh, those that we want to talk with. There's a lot of plans. We've put a lot of uh, plans into this fall season, uh, you can go to our blog site, powerofpreterism.wordpress.com, and we have a blog there called Falling Back to Genesis, and we're kind of keeping that as a running resource. So each week's podcast will be uploaded there, the variety of resources we have, the, um, the notes that we're taking. I haven't done that yet this week. However, I will be uploading all the notes that I took from Monday's session, the notes I'll take from today's session, and ultimately the notes that I take from Friday's session, and keeping them on that blog. And we'll continue again, till I think fall ends December 16th. So uh, we'll be journeying toward December 16th, having these conversations, welcoming so many interviews and conversations that I know you will be blessed by. So uh, matter of fact, uh, we'll be announcing it later. And I'll be reminding you, but Monday morning, we'll actually, we're actually going to have Dallas from Better Understanding the Bible as our guest. And we're going to talk with him about his testimony and how he's come to this understanding that, as I've mentioned in many other podcasts, uh, that you know, is blessing so many of us. And he's uh, really leaned in on a lot of Genesis chapter one and Genesis chapter, you know, throughout the book of Genesis. Uh, and I know I've been blessed by the Genesis one thoughts currently in study of that. Interestingly enough, I will mention uh, some of that in our discussion as we look at Genesis one today, I'll be mentioning Dallas as my resource, if you will, or uh, what I'm currently studying through to find some answers, namely regarding earth, trees and different language like that. So uh, for those of you that don't know who I am, I'm Mike Niano. I'm the pastor of the Blue Point Bible Church. I am the director of the Power of Preterism Network. And you can learn more about the Power of Preterism Network and, and engage us and be a part of what we're doing uh, by visiting powerofpreterism.com. Contact me, get on the email list, and uh, you'll be blessed by the clarity, healing, and strategy, or at least we pray that you will, uh, that we're bringing forth regarding the power and the advancement of preterist truth. So uh, that being said, again, I've thanked everyone. I'm grateful for uh, those of you that are here, those of you that are continuing to join in. Derek, I want to welcome you and say good morning. And uh, of course, we have Edward, Zach, Dallas, and me. So uh, that being said, and matter of fact, I have to say this, thank you to those of you that are tuned in online. Uh, we stream through Facebook, the Power of Preterism Network. So uh, those of you that are viewing online, I'm very grateful that you're deciding to be here with us. And also, those of you that review this on YouTube. So um, I pray that you uh, continue to be blessed by what we're bringing forth. Let's go ahead and open our session here in a moment of prayer, and then I'll share some announcements, some thoughts to get our Preterist Power Hour going, and then we will launch into Genesis chapter one. Let's pray. Mighty, gracious, loving God, Lord, we thank you for the wisdom that you provide. Your word tells us that if we lack wisdom, we can look to you, we can ask of you, Lord, and you will provide it liberally. We thank you, we praise you, and we trust you that you will continue to provide wisdom in that regard. Lord, there's many things that we could be praising you for as well as praying to you about in our lives, in our world. We recognize you as sovereign. We thank you for 
the fact that your spirit is what causes us to set our eyes on you as the author and finisher of our faith. Go before us in our time this morning, Lord. Be blessed by our conversation. Take it as the sacrifice of praise, giving honor to you, Lord. And of course, bless us in our fellowship together, our conversation, our study, and allow these things to be clarifying, beneficial, and ultimately God-glorifying. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So jumping right into this this morning, um, I want to share some, uh, well, first off, I want to say we're living in exciting times. Uh, I say that because I, you know, on, I'm very active on social media and there's all these other uh, new applications and efforts. Uh, Discord is something that we've been talking about recently that we're learning more about. Uh, I've talked about, um, now I'm forgetting the name of it, Clubhouse, uh, this audio app uh, that I recently was able to engage a lot of folks. And there's a conversation about preterism happening everywhere. It's been happening on Facebook for quite some time, over a decade now, uh, exploding on Facebook. There's so many different Facebook groups and different things. Twitter, matter of fact, there's a whole bunch of conversations about preterism. Instagram, uh, you know, I'm excited to see there's preterist Instagram pages. I mean, come on, folks. This is a God-glorifying truth that we're, we're seeing advance. And as that ancient rabbi Gamaliel had said, that if, you know, this is of God, and you come against it, you will find yourself fighting against God. And I truly believe that preterist truth is that reformation happening in our day, and we're, we're witnessing it. We're, you know, a part of it. And uh, I'm just excited to be a part of that. Someone just said that to me this morning. We're truly living in exciting times, and I, I truly believe that. So uh, all praise to God in that regard. Also, another reason why I wanted to do our Wednesday program today is I wanted to make sure that no one was raptured and I didn't know. Uh, many of you know last night was a blood moon. And, uh, you know, uh, there's obviously, I mean this facetiously, um, John Hagee published a book a couple of years back. It was based upon another book uh, about blood moons, and they use these in a sort of prophetic manner, you know, where the, well, the moon will turn red, uh, and this is going to be the end times and the rapture and all these different strange teachings that have come from that strange fire, if you will. And uh, that being said, I'm glad to see our usual group. We might have to be concerned about Brother Nick. So uh, somebody maybe want to check on him. Uh, if he was raptured, let me know. I don't know if that's good or bad. You know, I, obviously, you know that conversation, right? Uh, the, is the rapture a good thing? Those that are taken away, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, especially when you look at the days of Noah. So uh, I trust our Brother Nick is fine. Just kind of adding some humor to our discussion this morning. Um, I'm glad that we're seeing an end to that ideology there about the blood moons and people, you know, more often than not, the talking about it is facetious and, and humor rather than, uh, you know, folks saying, uh oh, we're going to get raptured today. Uh, and I also noticed, interestingly enough, I did a little bit of study yesterday wanting to see on Twitter, uh, you know, what people were saying about the blood moon. And uh, what I noticed was even the rapturists, if you will, those dispensationalists that hold to this premillennial rapture, they've backed up a bit and realized we cannot know the day or the hour. You know, we, we need not say the rapture is going to happen on the day of the blood moon. You know, it's going to happen around it, maybe within the next 40, 2000 years or something like that. Uh, you know, however you put that math together. So um, yeah, I'm glad to see that that's kind of waning. Praise God. And uh, on a positive note, something I want to share here uh, would be a quote from Eugene Peterson. Some of you might be familiar with the name. Uh, Eugene Peterson was the translator of the Message Bible. Uh, you know, he was the one that put forth that effort. And I know some might not like that. We talked a little bit about Bible translations last uh, on Monday. And um, yeah, I I've enjoyed the Message Bible all the while understanding it's not what I would use to do my exegesis. Uh, you know, it would probably be impossible to do that. Um, however, Eugene Peterson, he published a writing called Christ Plays in 10,000 places. And I want to read to you a quote that I found very encouraging, and I hope it speaks to what we do here uh, on the Preterist Power Hour. The community of Jesus betrays its master more often and damagingly, excuse me, damagingly, by the way it speaks and acts, rather than, hold on, excuse me, let me back this up. The community of Jesus betrays its master more often and damagingly by the way it speaks and acts than by anything ever says or does. I don't know why that word like that, but either way, I'm gonna continue the sentence. Anger and arrogance, violence and manipulation are ranked far higher than theological error or moral lapses in desecrating the holy resurrection community. And again, that's speaking to the church and maybe the first part of it I, I wasn't necessarily a fan of, uh, but what it's getting at here is that anger, arrogance, violence and manipulation those things, 
are the true issues that have plagued the body of Christ, rather than the, uh, you know, the, the theological error. We've seen distinction, division, confusion in 2,000 years of church history. Uh, and then also moral lapses, which again, we see, uh, I think it's Psalm 34, uh, where it talks of, or either Psalm 34 or 37, where it talks about, though a man fall. I love that text because what it doesn't say is, if a man falls. It says, though a man falls, meaning we're all going to fall. We're sinners in need of a saving God. So we need that grace and we need to note that. So no, it's not our personal sins that have desecrated the body of Christ. Well, they, they can and do. Uh, however, that's not the biggest issue, nor is it the theological confusion or error for that matter, but rather these attitudes of anger, arrogance, violence, and manipulation that have taken place in the church. Those are the true issues. Those are the true things that have unfortunately caused many to have a disdain for the church. So may we work against that. May we give each other grace in our theological, theological error. May we encourage each other in good morality. Uh, and um, and maybe move against anger, arrogance, violence, and manipulation in our lives, in the church, et cetera. I'm excited to tell you about a new resource I have my hands on. It's called the Hebrew Scriptures. I'm going to hold it up. I have a background here, so you might not be able to see the Bible up there. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's kind of getting in there. Anyway, now I'm totally gone. It looked like I was just raptured, didn't it? Uh, that being said, um, the Hebrew Scriptures is a, a resource that was published by McGeehan Publishers. And uh, what they did was they took out, I'll just read you the, the front here. Arrangement of the books follows the longstanding traditional order of the Hebrew Bible. And many of us know Jesus Christ. And I think it's Luke 21. He talked about the Torah, the, uh, the prophets, and the writings. Those were the three writings. And that's the order that they were found. So you had the law of Moses, you had the prophets, and then you had the writings, which would have included Psalms, et cetera. Um, so they, what they've done with this Bible is they've uh, put, the, put it back into the, the uh, Tanakh order, the, the Hebrew order there, if you will. And then also verse numbers have been removed with chapters only, line numbers in lieu of verses, and a single column format. So it's, you know, many of your Bibles have the two columns there for all the words. This is like a regular book where it's just, you know, one column and you read it as if it's a regular book. They've removed all the verses. Uh, there's these line numbers where it's like 10, 20, 30, 40. Um, very beneficial to just kind of getting a contextual read of these things that are happening here. Uh, 39 introductions written by 34 Old Testament scholars from across the globe. And uh, just a really beneficial work in my opinion. And um, that being said, uh, you could go look up McGeehan Publishers. That's MC. G-A-H-A-N, find the Hebrew scriptures. If you go to their publishing site, matter of fact, they're offering a $20 rebate. Uh, you can just put in the code and you'll get $20 off the, public, the, the book. And I believe you'll be blessed. I might intrigue you a bit with some quotes from the book that as I began yesterday, uh, kind of going through and, and I said, wow, this, I even said to my wife, if I might say this, I said, if this book doesn't help people understand the truth of preterism, I don't know that there's much hope uh, because again, you know, this kind of removes the verses, gets us out of that proof texting attitude and brings us into the context of the scriptures. A couple quotes. The Hebrew sequence suggests that the Torah is a nucleus surrounded by the expanding circles of the prophets and the writings. One sees more of an ethnical focus rather than an eschatological one with the Torah being a hermeneutical hub. I mean, Dallas, come on, brother. I thought of you when I read that quote. I said, that's exactly what we're getting at here, that the Torah is a nucleus. It's the, the, the hermeneutical hub for the way that we're going to read the rest of the Bible. I mean, come on, if you catch the power of that quote, I was like, I was like man, this is it. They, they get it. They see what we're, we're talking about with the Torah. Um, another quote, this may be the reason why the Torah often reigns supreme in Jewish contexts and is central for the task of repairing the world through obedience to the divine commands. While for Christians, the kingdom of God announced by the prophets is the perfect segue for transition to the New Testament. Because again, you understand the Torah, you understand the prophets, and this helps you understand what Jesus is saying in the New Testament in regards to the kingdom of God being the fulfillment of the Torah and the prophets. So just some really beautiful stuff. Another quote I have to share with you, this is a little bit longer, maybe a paragraph, if you will. And this one I found interesting. We'll say that. I don't know if it's 
just interesting. I want to put it before you and allow it to challenge your thought. A definite eschatological component is often overlooked, even what might be considered a messianic hermeneutic. The first book, Genesis, which begins with the creation of Adam, is organized in the form of genealogies leading to the blessings of a descendant from the tribe of Judah, to whom will be the obedience of the nations. Genesis 49, verses 21 through 37. This is resoundingly echoed in the last book, Chronicles, which begins with the genealogy of Adam, leading up to the history of David and his line from the tribe of Judah. This evokes images from the previous story, storyline of a Davidic ruler who will rule the world with peace and justice on the basis of the Davidic covenant. Also, at the end of the first book, Joseph predicts that God will surely visit the Israelites in Egypt and bring them up out of the land. At at the end of the last book, Cyrus announces that Yahweh has visited him to enable the exiles to go up from Babylon to return to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Thus, the first book ends with a note of an anticipated exodus from Egypt. And the last one, Chronicles, ends with a similar note of exodus from Babylon. Catch this. The question is left open. From which of these exiles will be the Davidic descendant to lead this new and greater exodus and rebuild the temple. I mean, is that not the eschatological hope? Who's going to be the Messiah? And how is he going to restore the temple uh, in its glory? And you know, if you're familiar with the New Testament and you read Revelation chapters 21 through 22, you should get a very clear picture of the exodus from that old covenant Babylon system into the glorious new covenant temple, Jesus Christ. And prayerfully, you are one of those lively stones building up that beautiful temple uh, to display God's glory to this world. So just some interesting stuff. I, I'm excited. Obviously, I'm very much at the beginning of this. Uh, however, I'm excited to get in on this resource and bless you with some of my thoughts. As I mentioned uh, in the back room uh, there before we came on live, I might end up using this translation, uh, which actually uses the CSB. I'll tell you another neat uh, coincidence in that regard. I bought my wife a Bible, a study Bible, a couple months ago, and um, I brought I bought her the CSB translation, Christian Standard Bible. As I mentioned to you, I use the NASB, and I was excited to see the differences between these you know these two different translations. And um, sure enough, the Hebrew Scriptures uses the CSB. So now my wife and I will be able to study together uh, through these things. You can imagine how excited she was uh, to hear that uh, in that regard. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll be uh, blessing you with some studies. Many of you know, uh, maybe you don't. Uh, my wife and I do a blog or a podcast, excuse me, uh, called You've Got Mail. It's the pastor and the mail lady. My wife does work for the post office there. So uh, we should, that's on Spotify, on Apple, on Buzzsprout. Uh, just go to You've Got Mail. The full title is You've Got Mail, The Pastor and the Mail Lady. Uh, of course, you can look up myself, Michael Miano. You can look up her, Rashonda Miano, and uh, you'll be able to uh, find that podcast. And I hope you're blessed. And if you can, if you listen to the podcast, please give us a rating. You know, that helps us get the word out there. And uh, our, our podcast is basically us. You get my theological ramblings. You get my thoughts about life and morality and, and you know, what it looks like to live a God, Christ-centered life. And, um, from my wife, you get relationship talk, you get, uh, you know, uh, a lot of encouragement, a lot of building up, which is a testimony to what she served in my life. So I encourage you, go ahead, listen to You've Got Mail, you will be blessed in that regard. So here it comes, let's fall back to Genesis, you ready? Fall back, okay. And uh, now that we're getting into it, I want to just highlight last week, or excuse me, Monday, uh, we talked through a couple things, and I just kind of want to bring us up to par with where we're at here. Uh, we marked out that there needs to be a contextual audience relevance perspective of what we're reading in Genesis 1. We need to understand, as Brother Edward had highlighted, the social and theological atmosphere that was going on there in Genesis chapter 1. Uh, I believe that's brought us to the ancient Near East. I think we've uh, uncovered a lot of the ancientness of this text here, the genre uh, being a temple text, as I've highlighted. I think we've noticed a lot of these things, while maybe not agreeing 100% with all the pieces, uh, we can see how this has helped us get a contextual view uh, of Genesis. And then also we talked about uh, the importance as we're going to get a narrative view of Genesis, we're going to see how this is used throughout the law of Moses, how this Genesis 
template, if you will, to appreciate what Dallas had mentioned last week, um, how this is used throughout the narrative of the Bible. And uh, that was, you know, the basics of what I believe we marked out on Monday and how we're going to move forward with this study. So we talked about in the beginning, and obviously I had mentioned there in the beginning of what, uh, and for many of you that don't know, I'm a covenant creationist, so I believe what we're reading here is the beginning of the covenant. We're reading a genealogy about the very, very beginning of what Israel would later know as their covenant with God. We talked about God. That was a fun one. And we can uh, obviously that's a conversation that's ever expanding. Uh, you know, the Elohim reference there and how it has a plurality to it. Uh, a good conversation to have. And I'm sure we will uh, enter back into that, especially as we move further into, let's say, Genesis 6, where we're going to see the uh, Bene Elohim and the uh, daughters of men, if you will. So we'll uh, probably have some conversation around that in weeks to come. Uh, Bara was a, a good focus for our study on Monday, where we talked about uh, this word create and the different scholarship that's led in on and looked at that word, uh, functional, non-functional creation. Uh, we talked about a covenant community demonstrating fruitfulness uh, is what we see right there in Genesis 1.1, uh, this prophetic picture of a covenant community that would manifest fruit. We, why do we believe that? Because we marked out heaven and earth. And uh, we, we talked quite a bit about the, the, the way heaven and earth is used in the scriptures, as well as, and I said, I will share my citations, which you can look at our blog in the next couple of days, and I'll have them up. Uh, and we also, as I appreciate Dallas had mentioned uh, that temples uh, were in the ancient world were often built around that imagery of heaven, earth, and sea. And we see this even with the Jewish community, Josephus. Uh, I appreciate, I, I wanted to mention this on the podcast last week. My wife said to me one day, and those of you that know me close, you can only imagine how overjoyed I was when my wife said, where, isn't there a quote where Josephus said that the temple was built around the imagery of heaven and earth? Like, you know, the guardians and the sky and the celestial things in the sky. And I just looked at her in amazement. <laughs> it's like, amen, you get it, you get it. So, uh, you know, the, the Jewish world understood this language of heaven and earth. And uh, I, uh, I'm glad that we do as well. So, um, by the way, I'm speaking a lot about my wife this morning. Today's our four month anniversary. So you would imagine I'm just kind of in the overjoyed moment there of uh, how blessed I am uh, in, in my marriage. So uh, pardon the constant assertion to my wife and, and bringing her up. Uh, that being said, uh, verse two of Genesis one, which is where we made it last week or on Monday, I keep saying last week because I'm used to the two programs, but Monday, uh, we talked about the earth uh, we're going to probably see a little bit more about that today as we move in on the days, uh, moving from verse three forward. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time talking about the tohu va bohu, the formlessness and void of uh, the, the, the deep, the waters, and the, uh, again, a lot of imagery and how that's used throughout the uh, rest of the Old Testament, uh, ultimately to talk about confusion, a lack of God's presence, and lack of function um, of bringing glory to God. And then as God does, in those situations, his spirit moves and he works. So he moves over the waters to cause order. And that's what we see as we're journeying a bit further into Genesis chapter one this morning. Two resources we mentioned were uh, the liturgy of creation. I, I have a bad habit of not writing down authors' names because I just Google everything. Uh, and then I generally remember the name as I look up the the, the resource. So uh, I didn't write the names of the authors down. However, uh, the Liturgy of Creation, and I will dig up the links and provide them on our blog. So you could go ahead and make that purchase of that book if you so choose. And then also, uh, we mentioned the mechanical translation of the Torah. Uh, and it was a subtitle I didn't write down. However, uh, those were two resources that we marked out as important for uh, gaining some insight and understanding of the things we talked about on Monday. That being said, I'm going to go ahead and put Genesis 1 on the screen. Yes, thank you, Zach. Uh, Michael Lefebvre uh, was the author of that book, uh, The Liturgy of Creation. I'm probably horribly pronouncing his name, so I apologize. Um, that being said, I'm going to put Genesis 1 on the screen, and we're going to begin journeying from verse 3 into the next couple of days. And I've put together a sort of uh, list of notes here to share, and I hope uh, you gentlemen have as well. I will unmute mics and we will enter in on conversation. And before we get in on verse two or verse three, excuse me, uh, I'll open up for any of you to uh, share a thought or two that you might want to say after I've just opened up our time. Okay. Uh, anything any of you want to say before we journey into verse three? I think you've premised it pretty well, so I'm pretty content with that. 
Okay. Well, then we will say this. Then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And now the whole show will just be right there. <laughs> um, you know, if I might say this, just kind of opening up uh, our conversation, uh, we see, matter of fact, let me go ahead and read verse four as well. God saw that the light was good and God separated the light from the darkness. So right here in my notes, just a preliminary thought would be, well, I've read about the light that came into the world in John 1. So uh, I'm biased. I have a, a, you know, a, 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 um, a preconceived notion, if you will, uh, that this light is speaking prophetically to God's work, especially the Messiah. And also I see two things about this light, where it says the light was separated from the darkness. This reminded me of what I've read in 1 Thessalonians 5, where there's children of the day, children of the light, and then there's children of the night, children of the darkness. Uh, you know, so there's that contrast. So for me, my preconceived notion, when I obviously read back into Genesis, that's why we're calling this, by the way, fall back into Genesis. This, you know, is an informed look at the things that we're seeing in Genesis. So for me, I see right there prophetic imagery. I, I know that this is definitely prophetic imagery, this light, uh, you know, and obviously I have to mention John 1 also follows the order of Genesis chapter one. Interesting uh, correlation there that has been brought out by Tim Martin and Jeff Bourne and Beyond Creation Science. So uh, for me, uh, the, the basics that I marked out was John one, uh, this light that it's speaking of here is, is God's work. It's what God does. He brings light into this world. He brings clarity into this world. And by the time of the New Testament, we know it's speaking to Jesus, the Messiah. Uh, so uh, gentlemen, please jump on in here. What are you seeing in these verses three and four? Well, the, uh, the word says that, you know, we're set apart. We're a peculiar people. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's what I'm seeing in that also. That's right. And it's good. <laughs> Amen. Uh, that's right. So very well said, Edward. Tell us anything. So, nope. Well, just in a response to the John one, the comparison that I find very fascinating with it is I don't believe that they're necessarily uh, connected in the sense of this influences this as much as what I see John doing is he's taking the template and he's applying it to the revival of Christ and the new covenant. So he's actually using that old template of the Old Testament, old covenant, and he's using that same similar language to write out the new covenant. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's why the language continues. Is why would the language change? It was the order of the covenant that changed. And that's what I think. So just in contrast, what you're saying there, and I did follow your lead. I made notes. So instead of rambling on, like I tend to do, <laughs> uh, unless you want to respond to that, uh, John thing. I appreciate that you brought that up, Dallas. And yes, I remember that in our previous conversation, we had talked about, I know you make a point, a good point at that, uh, where you see Christ being talked about in that the land, the earth, uh, you know, that's where you ultimately see the picture of Christ being. So I do understand our, our difference in that regard. And, you know, I, I guess I, I, it drives me back to want to read J John 1 again. And, and again, holding on to, which I wholeheartedly agree with, seeing this as a template. So, you know, I do agree with that. And I, I want to, uh, you know, I'm going to play around with that and see uh, how I can maybe further uh, bring you over to my side or, you know, and, and again, uh, you know, uh, see the truth in what you're saying there. So, Absolutely. Well, let me just throw this bone into that uh, tug of war of dogs then. <laughs> John, in his letter, says, we testify to the things that we've seen from the beginning. So when John says in the beginning in his gospel, he's talking about things he physically saw. That was the beginning. We also see that phrasing throughout. So I would suggest as you looked into that, that's a really good direction because in the beginning is a very powerful uh idiom and i know you're well aware of that and that's where i think the change of the language becomes a very interesting study is because they're always looking for it to come but then when we get to the new testament the language all changes to it has come now we they're looking back at it mm -hmm. so there was a forward and then a backward view so that's where it's a very interesting study if i might say one last thing to that and then i'll welcome uh, zach and edward to, to jump in here um i see what you're saying there dallas because what we might agree on here is there were two different lights, right? Each covenant had its light that it was manifesting. So I see what you're pointing out, almost, a, in my opinion, a correlation to 1 Peter 1, 
where that salvation, that light had not yet been shown uh, in the old covenant. So it was being made known what John is doing in John 1, making known that new covenant light. So I see what you're getting at there and probably more inclined to agree than disagree. <laughs> Gentlemen, you want to jump in? Zach, Edward? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Go, uh, go on, Zach. Edward. You, you oh. first, Zach. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess, first of all, just in sort of a... Um, we're getting into the, you know, the prophetic aspect of this, which is um, obviously, you know, a big part of the point of, uh, uh, of this verse. Um, but also, I, I think it'd be, you know, helpful to talk about why this makes sense symbolically. Um, I think people tend to think, oh, well, what's being talked about is light and light's made out of photons and we know all about physics and things. And um, that's where people get tripped up using a modern mindset and trying to interpret um, the meaning of these passages. Um, but within its context, obviously the, this was written, you know, thousands of years ago and, you know, Scientific understandings about what light is were not um, did not exist back then. They were just not thinking in those types of um, in that type of mode. But they did have an experience of what light was, and um, they did have a concept of what light is and what it does. Um, and it sort of—I mean—I think it lines up a lot of what our own experience is, sort of 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 light, um, you know, there's a contrast between the light and the dark and the, you know, the emptiness and the waste from the preceding uh, verse and what the light does and what I think in our, you know, normal experience of what light is and what it does is it uh, illuminates things. It gives things meaning. It allows you to make out things that maybe in the dark, you can't really see, you can't make it out, or maybe it's, um, you know, a little bit chaotic as to what you're actually looking at, but light comes in and it makes things visible and it makes things meaningful. Um, and it allows you to, you, you know, view, you know, objects and also the world around you. Um, and that sort of reminds me talking in a, you know, prophetic sense about, how Christ is talked about in the New Testament. You know, he, he um, I believe in Hebrews, it says Christ, you know, exegetes the Father. He makes the Father known. He illuminates who the Father is. Um, and, and so I think that's, that's a, a sort of a crucial, you know, starting point for how we begin to look at, you know, why that, yes, there is a prophetic meaning, but why does that meaning make sense? Right. Another aspect of it is if you do look, take this as being sort of an agricultural text, what's the importance for light in, you know, an agricultural setting? And this is about what light does. Um, plants need light to grow. Uh, and that's within, you know, the cultural context of an agricultural society so that they understand that you can't be fruitful without light. Um, you need the times of the light to have plants grow. So you're seeing, you know, a preparation for fruitfulness. And I think that goes in, again, that's prophetically, you know, seen in the New Testament where we talk about the harvest and we talk about the fruit. What's a prerequisite, prerequisite for that is, you know, Christ as the light being able to provide the beginnings of fruitfulness. Hey, Amen. You know, if I might respond to that, uh, a couple of things, Zach, uh, I, I'm, I'm actually intrigued because what we're saying here about the light is actually causing me to double back on some things that I've previously, uh, you know, noted. Again, as with Jesus, the Messiah, you know, I see something different happening here in Genesis 1 through 3, uh, Genesis 1, 1 through 3, uh, this old covenant prophetic picture here of God doing something. That's why if you notice when I said uh, light, not only does it point to the Messiah, but it also points to God's work. And that's what I believe is happening here. As we talked about on Monday, we see darkness right there in verses one and two, and then God's spirit hovers and he manifests light, which we're going to notice probably in a more prophetic way as we go on. 
This is talking to that covenant picture there that these people had. So, you know, that's where I am kind of agreeing with uh, Dallas in this regard that, you know, this is speaking more to the old covenant light, the lesser light, if you will, uh, that was being made known. Now, Zach, another thing I wanted to respond to was I appreciate that you brought that up. Like, I guess another way I would word it is why doesn't the the normal or the uh, often used way of reading Genesis, uh, you know, this sort of, uh, you know, this is about our, our physical creation, um, you know, the earth and everything else. Uh, not to say that it doesn't have elements of that, that it speaks to light, as you're rightly pointing out. But one of the things I've often said would be verse five, right? So here we read, God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning one day. Now, uh, obviously, the first question we have to ask is, wait a minute, there was evening and there was morning without the sun, moon and the stars. How does that work? And that's what I wrote here in my note. I just wrote how. Uh, you know, that doesn't make good nonsense. So um, there we know that this text is not speaking to this, uh, you know, that for me, that causes me to double back and realize, oh, there's something different going on here. This isn't uh, about, you know, a literal day ending, a 24-hour day, and then a God did another thing as, you know, the very basics of what I hear a lot of young earth creationists highlighting. I'm like, well, that doesn't work because there's no sun, moon, and stars on the first day. They don't come until I think day four or something, day three or four, somewhere over there. Uh, so that's a uh, problematic in my opinion. So uh, I agree with you, Zach. I think that, you know, we, we do need, what we're highlighting is the importance and, and the uh, effectiveness of reading this through a prophetic lens rather than, you know, the common assertions that have been made. Yeah. And it's, and it's a symbolic lens, but symbols, there's a reason that symbols, you know, can hold these types of meanings. Mm -hmm. Like, like you're not going to say, well, you're not going to reverse it and say, you know, you know, darkness helps you understand what things mean. Um, when things are dark, you know, um, that really gives them meaning. No, I mean, because that's not our experience. So when you're talking about a symbol, you don't necessarily, I mean, the point is not, you know, the physicality of it. It's how, how, how can it contain the meaning um, that it's being used for? So, I mean, my point is not to say, okay, so let's, this is simply about light. It's that light is being used as a symbol, a covenant symbol. And the reason it would have a certain resonance and how people can, are able to interpret it is because within their own experience, um, the symbol can make sense. Okay. Before you get going there, Edward, I'd like to respond to that as well. Just simply... <laughs> A term I've come to use uh, with referencing this is hyper-literalism. And I think it's really become a problem because just like Mike was pointing out there, a general reading of this cannot be taken literally. There's just no possible way. It makes no logical sense. There's no 24-hour day because there's no sunrise and sunset, which the day is based around. We also see God said the light was day. Well, it wasn't day until day four that the sun was made. So how is there a light? in the day and how is there a moon for the night there's no the entire process of what we consider to be a day is an astrological event so it's not even there so i would tend to not only agree with you but i would even go as far as to assert that trying to read this from any type of hyper literalist point of view would will never bring you to any type of meaningful understanding of the script like you said uh there's no way to take away this symbol because then it becomes unreality so I think you made a really good point, and uh, that goes great with how I've been trying to express hyper-literalism will never bring about an actual rendering of information. Yes. So I would like to say, <clears throat> with the language of the scripture, and what we read in uh, is throughout scripture, when, when they talk about day, day is talking about those that have clarity, those that have that, that have the uh, the the insight, you know, those of the night, they're in darkness, they, they're, they're unaware, you know, because when it talks about, uh, uh, um, let me see, his coming or things of that nature, he said, uh, we don't want to be ill-informed, we want to be the, the children of the day, you know, but anyway, I wanted to go to, uh, to, to verse four, where it talks about God saw the light was good, uh, according to scripture, there's nothing good but God. So I'm, I'm thinking, you know, Jesus Christ, you know, that, you know, God saw that it was like, uh, well, 
um, when um, Jesus came into the world, uh, um, let me see, um, God, um, how does the scripture say it? Um, in the fullness of time, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those of the law. So the, the, the world was somewhat, you know, in darkness and God gave, gave them light, Jesus Christ. You oh, know, in the midst of darkness, you know, this Sorry, is what I'm thinking. I, gotta, I did want to jump in there and say the world was in darkness. Not yes. some, it was. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I, I wanted to appreciate what you're saying there. However, I did want to mark out a contrast. You're saying the fullness of time. We're saying in the beginning. So yes. we're not at the fullness of time yet. We're in the beginning. You see? So I was I, using language kind of. No, and you're right. You're not, you're not wrong in using language. I just want to. I want to help us see what I think we're kind of pointing out here that this light that's being manifest here, we have to be consistent. We, you know, we do believe it's prophetic, of course, pointing to the need for the new covenant. Is that not what the apostle Paul says the goal of the old covenant was, right? That, that mm -hmm. uh, you know, the reason the law was given, the reason this light was given was to show the need for the new covenant. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, I really am doubling back, if you will, on looking at this light as Jesus. I think that, you know, there, the light is Jesus, the capital L light, if you will, uh, is Jesus. Uh, you know, oftentimes in our teachings, we'll talk about the capital G God in contrast to the you know, lowercase G gods. Um, so I do believe that the true light that gives light, life to every man, somebody said that once, uh, Jesus, uh, that light is Jesus, yes. However, uh, here I don't believe that that's what we're, we're seeing. I think that we're seeing what we should note and what I think we are kind of all agreeing on here is we see God bringing in clarity. We see God yeah. providing clarity in the midst of this darkness that was taking place in one and two verses one and two. And God is now bringing in light. And mm -hmm. I believe, again, that's the beginning of the story of the old covenant. Amen. So now can I bridge both of those? Please. Because that's what I believe is taking place is when we read in Peter. So Exodus 19 is the covenant agreement between Israel and God. When Moses goes up and the agreement was that if you are faithful and obedient, then you will receive and become a kingdom of priests, a holy nation and a peculiar people. Well, Peter brings it up saying that you are the chosen generation, the holy nation, the people, the peculiar people. But how? And he says right after that, for you have been delivered from darkness into his marvelous light so the old covenant is still a form of darkness the new covenant is light however there was a transitioning where the darkness of the old covenant was a light mm -hmm. so we get a greater light and we get a lesser light but both of them are covenants they're not a person why does jesus become the person because he becomes the living blood sacrifice of the covenant. So he is the covenant, but he's not the light, but the light fulfilled in the promise landed in him as the individual that it all fulfilled and manifested. So he became the capital L light hmm. because he was the fulfillment of the first, the ending of it, but also the beginning of the new. So he was the son, S-U-N, of righteousness hmm, the light of righteousness amen <laughs> exactly he's the greater light mm -hmm. not on but the greater light was not until he came so it's it's very interesting language so to me though they meld together exactly what edward was saying mm -hmm. in the person of jesus and the aspects of that language and how you're saying it is also the covenant but they merge together as the same yeah, you know, and by the way, uh, I wrote down a note there. I think you gave me a good uh, way to bring this over to what we read in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 through 5. Uh, for those of you that are familiar there, you know, you talk about the light that Moses brought forth, right? A light that was uh, veiled. And then there's the greater light that was being made known through the new covenant. So uh, Exodus 19, 2 Corinthians 3 through 5, I'm seeing some interesting correlation uh, to those points there. So, And yeah. who was Jesus? He was the light that shined out of darkness. Hmm. He came out of Israel. Israel was darkness. Right. Exactly. Right. Hmm. And he became the new Israel, the light, the actual light that sits on the actual Mount Zion, shining the actual light to the world now. Because like you said, we're no longer in darkness. You know, 
I might also note this, I just wrote this down in my notes here. That's an interesting phrase, I think, to study out. Light out of darkness in contrast to what we're reading here in verses three through four about light separated from darkness. You know, I think there's a cool uh, thing that we might be able to see there. Uh, separated light from darkness is obviously that old covenant picture, whereas now in the, as Christ comes into the world, bringing light out of the darkness, he clarifies again, bringing us back to the Galatians 3 reference that Paul said, the reason why this law was given was to, namely, to paraphrase, provide the way to the Messiah, you know, the need for the Messiah. So I'm just seeing a lot of cool allusions there in this covenant language and how this is used. Cool. So then I'll give my little rendering here of Genesis 1, because I actually made the notes so that I won't waver, <laughs> because I tend to. So uh, just summarizing, bringing us up then from Genesis 1, I'm going to land on 1.5. So in Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, we get God making the covenant declaration. I'm, so in the beginning, God made the covenant. 1.2. But the land, because he was at the beginning, the land was yet without order, and it was still empty. So there was no beginning. So we're just hearing in the beginning, there was no land, there was no order, it was empty. Mm -hmm. Then we continue into one three. So God said, let there be light, let there be order. And that order is the law covenant. And he set that automatically then separates it from the darkness, which is the no order, the confusion that was on the depreciated state of uh, the earth and the heavens so in the beginning the earth was void and without was without form and unfilled it was darkness was over the seas so you had the confusion you had all that that was taken away by the light so we get that structural uh, event taking place of order being set over a disorganized situation and that goes into uh, verse five which now god gives us or the covenant paper now gives us the primer what do we as individuals since that event took place how do we define it so now we're given our language to define the order god just gave which is we are to call the uh, light good we are to call the light day that's where god is and that's the order as opposed to darkness now we have if light is good darkness now is imputed it doesn't say it directly but obviously it's imputed that it's bad that then also tells us that it's the night which is apart from god that's in transgression from order so in genesis 1 1 to genesis 1 5 i see the structure of law being established amongst the land that is being created but it has does that make sense it's the forming because we're watching this is a picture and this is just one aspect of the picture we're looking at and those other aspects of that same picture get added in in the different days as opposed to events taking place and in this part of the picture we're looking at we're watching the depreciated state with god coming in and saying i'm going to organize this i'm going to give it light we're going to give it structure we're going to give it purpose and now you're going to refer to this order as that and those who don't are separated. They're out of that order. They're not part of it. And that becomes the basis for the community to distinct, to make them distinct amongst the others. Those who are part of this light, this order, are not part of the darkness. So we get the original structure of the first stage of God separating a covenant people. That's what I see in Genesis day one. Amen. Yeah, and again, you know, that actually, if I may, uh, kind of, well, no, that was day one. All right. Yeah. So absolutely. I do see that, you know, let their day one is, is creating that beginning, the order that's now going to become known as the land, you know, the earth, uh, as we're going to see as we move further in these texts. So I, I definitely, uh, I'm tracking with you and I agree. But then there's the prophetic, which I agree also, because when we look at the words associated and now we can do that, right? Because now we're past it. We're now moving into the other scriptures where we actually do see this light being directly referred to in Psalms and prophets as the law. So if you want to go and check this out, and if you want to see why I am absolutely beyond convinced that the law is the light in Genesis 1, go read Psalm 119, where it starts out with, I love the law, and the law is a lamp unto my path and a light to my feet. Revelation 21 follows that up with the new heaven and the new earth, 
that now we have the God and the lamb being the light and the lamp. And that's the new covenant. So to me, the light in Genesis 1, day 1, must be the declaration and beginning of the covenant due to the language structure also throughout the rest of the Bible. So not only as you and I would look at it in its individual standalone first polemic text not only does it say it but i also believe the rest of the bible uses the language in order with that amen and and i'll sum that up with one quote by jesus because he uses this language directly in john when he says i am the light of the world he who follows me will not fall will not uh, stumble in darkness but will have the light of life amen well said. You know, if I might just say this quickly here, jump in there. Psalm 119 is so full of theology. Uh, so full. I know it's a rather long text. However, it's so full of theology. Something I noticed more recently uh, studying through the word arrogance is interestingly enough in the Old Testament, Psalm 119 is where you see the most reference to arrogance, which now tie that in and what we're saying here. If Psalm 119 is pointing out the old covenant, what became the problem by the time of the first century? was the arrogance of the old covenant people that was coming under judgment. So interesting uh, connection. That is interesting. I've never thought of that. That's cool. So the day, so the day is considered like the, the covenant uh, relationship with God, and then darkness is separation from God. Mm -hmm. Well, what do we hear when we read the text? Uh, that uh, death is darkness, and sin is death, mm -hmm. and transgression of the covenant is sin. So that's all is one sentence. If yeah. I transgress, I am falling into death and death is darkness. So, yeah. and that's Genesis one, literally those who are in the light are in life in God's presence. Those mm -hmm. who are in darkness are separated. They're the non covenant people and they're considered dead. Yes. And then that's what we see in Genesis. In, uh, and I really appreciate you bringing this up. Uh, Mike is the scripture where it says we are now children of the day but we used to be children of the night so that they were children of the law, the ministry of death, darkness. Right, so yeah. it's very consistent, very consistent. Yeah. <laughs> That's some solid stuff. Edward, you're going to jump in. No, I was just going to say, uh, being that <clears throat> we're to give God, uh, um, not only praise, but we're to, uh, express to the world, I'm paraphrasing, we're to express to the world the goodness of God for bringing us out of darkness into his marvelous light. There you go. Amen. 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 Well what said. did uh, Jesus say? He said, I am the light of the world. But then what does he call those who he now calls fruit? You are the light of the world. Hmm. That's exactly our purpose. Just as the light of the world in, Gen in uh, Genesis 1, chapter 4, and there's the lights who are supposed to shine light on the earth. Jesus tells his converts, now you are the light. Go shine light on the earth. It's a very interesting parallel. That's why, the, to me, that template is so important to understand that it wasn't done away with. It was just transferred under a new uh, owner, a new person to administer it. So it went, that kingdom that Adam ruled over is the same kingdom that Noah ruled over, is the same kingdom that Mo Moses ruled over, but it wasn't ever actually administered properly until Jesus established it. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right, well, I'm going to move us into the next text. Obviously, we could talk about the light all day, which is a good thing, but we have <laughs> a lot of time there. Uh, so let's move into verse six here. And uh, we see, then God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters and let it separate the waters from the waters. And if I may just bear with me one second here, I'm going to read into verse eight. I think that's important here at this point. Uh, God made the expanse and separated the waters, which were below the expanse from, and I know some translations probably say firmament. Uh, that's a one translation of that word there uh, it, from the waters, which were above the expanse. And it was so. God called the expanse heaven. And there was evening and there was morning a second day. If I might just say this to preface our time, uh, I've noted in my notes, so uh, this, this language here looks very similar to ancient Near Eastern cosmology. 
you know, you look into the way they believed, you know, that the, there was the dome over the earth and then, you know, there's the waters above, there's the waters below. Uh, this dome is what is the heavens. And ultimately there's some charts. I wish I would have dug one up to share with you on the screen today. However, they're all over the place. Just look up ancient Near Eastern cosmology, A-N-E cosmology. And you'll find those charts with, you know, this land and then the arch over it, which is the firmament. And then the waters and above, the waters below. Uh, just interesting stuff. And I know uh, I'll be mentioning this, so I'm going to say it now. Uh, Dallas, going through his videos at Better Understanding the Bible on YouTube, has really been beneficial for me to see a lot of this. I know Dallas marked out uh, a point there about uh, we see, you know, you see order happening here. You see uh, rulership, if you will, uh, divine rulership happening through these texts. And uh, that's kind of what I see going on. So I'm curious to see what the rest of you have to say about verses six through eight. Nothing. Okay, well, I'll, I'll go if nobody wants to jump. I, I talk a lot, so I'll, I give the floor to everybody else first. So <laughs> uh, when I read this, to me, this is a continuation. So if the first day is the establishment of the declaration, so to me, it's I'll speak it plainly, and if you want to know the reasoning why, go check out my channel. But plainly speaking, day one was the declaration of the covenant and the dividing of the people. Day two, God is now making a place for himself. He's the waters above, and he's dividing himself from the people below. Just as we read in day one, we have the light being divided from the darkness. Well, where was the darkness? It was on the waters. Well, now we got two groups of waters. We have the waters which are good, which are above, and the waters which are below, which are dark, the bad. And what's fascinating is immediately just as we read in Genesis 1, once the declaration and the explanation of what the light is, it's followed up with what are we supposed to call this, the primer. Day two, we get the declaration of the order. God will be above, there'll be a division, and the people will be below. And then we're told what to call that, heaven. So now here we have a place in this. And I, uh, I used the quote from Josephus as well. So I think that was awesome. You're, you brought that up with your wife, where it talks about Josephus says that when Moses delineated positions for men amongst the covenant, he did so by creating a place for heaven where only God can be. Then below that was the place of the earth and the sea, the two places for the men. Uh -huh. So we get that division amongst the culture. We get that amongst the social situation that people were living under amongst the other peoples and that same divide themselves from the peoples. At the same time, it creates God's divinity by putting him above all, where we now establish language for the whole Bible. We must be raised up. We want to be above. We get life from above. It's waters above, right? Well, no one enters into the kingdom of heaven unless it's through water. We go through water baptism. Water is the life. God is the, sitting on the throne in which the water of life pours down into the earth to water all the earth. Water is the symbol of Mesopotamia's system of existence. They live in a template of a land that is a bowl. They go through floods and they go through dehydration. They've come to appreciate the power of water and how it is destructive and salvation all in the same word. Therefore, God is the water of life and the water that comes to cleanse when it be, needs to be cleaned. So God is above. And those are the light waters, which we'll see later <laughs> as it continues on. And below we get the dark waters separated from God, which is just a different picture of the exact same thing we read in Genesis in day one, the light from the darkness. Well said. So, so I, I, um, what I also I see, you know, um, that I forgot the other gentleman's name that that brings this up quite often about um, God being in heaven and the earth being His footstool. You know, Isaiah sixty one. Okay, yes, okay. So where um, uh, all authority comes from above and, and, his, and, his, and his people on, of the earth to um, express to the seas, you know, that which they receive from God. I don't know, to be the light to the nations. I, I don't, you know, I'm trying to. 
Anyway. You're going perfect with my mind. That's exactly how I put it together. <laughs> so keep going. Okay. <laughs> okay. So that's it, basically. Because yeah. the, we got the light of the heavens shining down on the earth. Well, we're going ahead. We'll, we'll get to that when we get to those days. Yes. I did want to say uh, what I appreciate that you said there, Dallas. I wrote a quote here, uh, a place for himself. You know, that's what we see in, in verses six through eight. I think that's a great way to uh, mm -hmm. highlight that, to make it clear. Uh, you know, day one was this declaration uh, of, uh, you know, the covenant. And then day, uh, excuse me, uh, day two, we're going to see this, uh, you know, that he, he creates a place for himself. And obviously he does quite a bit on day two. So uh, we need to, you know, what's also interesting about that. It's the only day in the Masoretic text of creation. That's not good. Separating God from the people is the only declaration in Genesis as creation. That is not good. Amen. It's important, very important to hear. Why? Because the new heaven, the new earth no longer has any sea. Now it's good. There's no division between God and man. Amen. That's a really good point. I, I did note that in my, uh, this morning when I was actually doing the reading again, I noticed and I, I did, wasn't sure if I wanted to mark it out, but I'm glad you said that. <laughs> it does make sense that, you know, that was the one day that just there was, it was not good. Uh, that, you know, the Lord would be separated from the peoples in either regard, you know. So. And if we read that and apply that as prophetic language, as peoples, as you're saying, which I agree to do, we also read, then if God is separated from the peoples, well, what's the big deal in Genesis or in uh, Jesus's coming was that the people who were once far off have now been brought in. Yes. So it actually does make logical consistency through the entire bible and that's what started breaking down my oh my god this isn't just this can't be creation if this is creation not only am i crazy but so are these prophets in the new testament so no this isn't crazy this is language and it was language by a people who have an understanding of it and that's the only reason why it flows otherwise we're we're i can't do it to moby dick <laughs> <laughs> No other book seems to do that. So I think that's it's pretty cool to attach that. Sorry, I'm rambling. Hey Amen. Well, hey, I, I agree with you. And I, I think you're making some great points. If I may just back up, I wanted to uh, correct something I had done here in my notes. I confused myself. So what we noted was verses three through five was day one. Now we're noting verses six through eight is day two. Uh, I noticed I kind of condensed my notes here and I, I didn't notice that that was the end of day two. So the rest of the verses, nine through 13, become day three and what we're seeing on day three. So just wanted to highlight that for everyone. So I would note day two, I think the perfect way that I'm going to start telling folks is that was when God created a place for himself and denoted, you know, that the, the separation between the heavens and the uh, the earth and, you know, the, and the, the heavens, earth and the sea, if you will, which we're going to see further as we move into verses nine and 10 uh, in our text. So I like that we noted that the, the expanse, uh, again, there's different words that are used, a uh, firmament expanse heavens. Uh, we see those as our, uh, necessary terms for heaven is a little different though, because God tells us directly in the script that that division is to be called heaven. Hmm. Right. So it doesn't matter what word it was originally translated, expanse, separation, firmament, Whatever that word was, we are given direct order in this uh, primer when it says, which I'm just looking at the scripture here, it's uh, uh, 1 8. And God called the expanse heaven. So he named whatever that original word is expanse, firmament, whatever. We, under this agreement, are to refer to that division as heaven. Hmm. That's what's so cool about the primer. We, under the division, are now also supposed to refer to light as day. So it, does that, you see that language is being created for us. We're being told those who are in the order, those who are in the light, are going to. that's their language now. He's telling us this is the order I'm giving it. So the firmament, the division between man and God, in the order of this covenant of day one and two, will be referred to as heaven. Just as in this covenant, in this community, the light will be referred to as the day. So I think it's interesting. It's telling us how to speak the covenant. Hmm. I follow that. I, I definitely appreciate that, you know, that uh, a primer, a, a template. I've definitely uh, taken that in and I'm obviously uh, still considering that and welcoming that as I'm going through my study. So amen. 
any other thoughts I, in regards to uh, i just want to say again if i'm coming across strong and uh, especially viewers that aren't familiar with my language i may have very strong language uh, it's only because I'm confident in what I'm doing. I do admit that this is a new, this is new to me as well. Like I've only been dealing with this as long as I have been. And I've come from the same place where a lot of people have, just like you guys here. So it's just a process. And if I come across really strong and authoritative, I don't mean to belittle your positions. It's just, there's reason and we should be discussing that reason. And that's, I, that's what we're doing. Amen. If I might assert an apostolic encouragement, be strong in the Lord. Amen. <laughs> we appreciate your strength. Um, I'm going to move us further. We're going to move into verses 9 and 10 here. Uh, I think we, we kind of marked out a good, some good points there about verses 6 through 8, unless there's somebody here that has wants to add some thoughts. Okay, so let's go ahead and take a look at verses 9 through 10. Uh, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth and the gathering of the waters he called seas and God saw that it was good. So of course, just a quick preliminary thought here. I have a very quick thought. You have to check out better understanding the Bible on YouTube, uh, you know, because again, uh, you go through some of the, the sessions there, Dallas, obviously uh, Dallas is here with us. He really gets in on, in my opinion, a lot of these teachings, and that's why I'm going to kind of defer to you gentlemen on these uh, two texts here, two verses, uh, because as I've, I'm still kind of learning, I'll say that, I'm, I'm just journeying through this, I'm familiar with the land language in the Bible and how it's used prophetically, uh, earth, if you will, and seas, I'm very familiar with that, however, as I've mentioned uh, weeks ago, I'm, I'm still kind of developing my, uh, my comfortability with uh, carrying that forward. So uh, I'd be more inclined to want to hear from the rest of you uh, what you're seeing in this regard than my points. Okay, what I, what I see is kind of future, is uh, Jew and Gentile becoming one, one body, one spirit, one mind, you know, the body of Christ. That's what I kind of see in that regard. So you see a prophetic picture pointing to the hope for the- yes. Using yes. the Gentiles to be united. Okay. I, yes. I can definitely see that. Zach, um, did you have anything you wanted to say? I did. Oh. Um, and uh, thanks, Dallas. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, I'm, again, I'm going to go back to why this symbol makes sense within its context. Um, and Dallas mentioned this a little bit. Um, this, you know, this, this day is sort of the culmination of a first three-day cycle, with ends with which ends with you know the fruitfulness of the land. Again, we're in a agricultural context, as Michael you've talked about. This is a liturgical temple text, um, so we've had the light providing, you know, light. We have the firmament being the origin of the rains, which is necessary for you know, the growth of agricultural products. And now we have, as Dallas pointed out, within a Mesopotamian context, we have the flood waters receding from the land. And again, in Mesopotamia, um, in Egypt too, and in Israel, um, the winter season is the season of the floods. And those floods, again, they provide, um, necessary nutrients to the land and the necessary watering of the land to provide for fruitfulness. But you cannot start to harvest until the floodwaters have receded and the dry, dry, the dry ground has appeared. So we have, again, the symbols, the, you know, the actual experience that the people that would have heard this, they're why these symbols would have made sense to them, because you see the, the waters receding, you see the dry ground appearing. And of course, the result of that is, yes, you have the, um, the growth of the crops. And, you know, again, you, you, you see the, the fruitful culmination of this first three-day cycle, which in, maybe in some sense is prophetic of the next three-day cycle within the, um, this seventh-day uh, liturgy. But you know, that's, that's, I think it's sort of a necessary to understand, you know, why this language, the symbolic language will make sense 
particularly to the people that would have heard it by understanding, you know, from their experience, what do these symbols sort of mean? Yes. I uh, want to back that up 100% because I think that backs me up 100% on uh, my idea of my basic hermeneutic, which is an old Sumerian, or probably a group of, this is probably the common thought at the time, most likely, looking at nature, saying this is how God created everything. Therefore, let's take that God created natural template and build our community after it. So I totally agree. And I think that's the natural. And I think Paul backs that up in Romans 1 when he says, I think it's verse 126, where all things that are, uh, all things are clearly displaying the character, the knowledge of God in creation. I'm paraphrasing that. I'm saying that wrong. But Paul said, everything in creation displays God. So I totally agree with you. And I think that's fantastic. And it's an interesting thing because that's the layer that can't be taken away. It has to be used. You can never forget that that's why it's important. But that's also why I think is neat with the layer Edward is bringing up because he's taken that same language and now it's about a prophecy of a time to come. Now I'm going to take that exact same foundation and language and say, let's put it into legalese or prophetic language. So we got the prophecy time period, the language, the general language. We got the truth of the symbols, which make that language exist, like Zach said. And then when we read, let the waters under the heavens be gathered into one place, we're seeing order. So we're seeing law. So it's fantastic because these layers have to, not one of these layers can be removed. And not one of these layers takes away from one another. But if you took one of these layers away, you're going to drastically reduce your comprehension of the text. And there's obviously more layers yet. But it's, this is why it's so important to listen to everyone. So I just want to say thank you, Zach. That's fantastic. And you're the only one I've ever heard back me up on that. So great. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> okay, Pastor, after you finish your thought, I would like to share. <clears throat> Actually, I, I don't have, I know Dallas probably has some thoughts he wants to share on these texts here. Uh, I might just mention this uh, one verse that I did mark out that I found interesting in reference to the seas uh, would be a Psalm chapter 65, verse seven. It says, who does still the roaring of the seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples. So for me, there's your uh, talk about the legalese and the template language. Uh, you know, you see Genesis is talking about these seas and as I journey into Psalms, it, it doesn't surprise me that the Psalm is actually giving you the definition. It's telling you that the seas are the, you know, the raging of the seas is the tumult of the peoples. Uh, so just uh, one quick correlation I wanted to make there. Uh, Edward, go ahead. And then if Dallas, you wanted to jump in, you have some thoughts, uh, please. And Zach, if you, hopefully you exhausted yours, but if not, please jump in. Okay, real fast, I wanted to say in verse nine, then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. I'm thinking that word gathered, you know, uh, and the heavens being uh, the land, um, the peoples, and, 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 and the waters being the nations being gathered into one place, into one body, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. So they all become one people, you know, that's kind of how I have saw that, you know, in the future, <laughs> become one people, no more Jew, Gentile, and things of that nature. And there's no more sea. Uh, yes. Uh, again, <laughs> uh, continuing upon that uh, prophetic imagery of the, the seas there, amen. Uh, you know, I absolutely agree with you. So before I jump in then, Zach, were you done exhausting? Did you want to yes. get going? Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go on. Oh, okay. So when I read this in Genesis 9, what I see now is part two to Genesis day one. So in Genesis day one, what we see is the earth is what? It's covered in water. So God causes a wind to blow over the water. And that now we go into uh, verse nine and he had the waters all gathered together on one side. So we actually have a triangle. If we were to draw this out, we would have a circle on top, which would be God or the waters, a line underneath. So like a dividing line. And below that, we get another circle. So we get the division. That's where we get our division symbol from, is the dot, the line, and the dot. Well, that's the waters above, waters below. But then something else happens where that waters below separates again. But now we have waters to the left, 
and we have the dry land up here. So we had, does that make sense? We're, we're getting order. We're getting structure. Yes. We have God above, separated by the heavens, living in the heavens. And then below him, we now have a dry land. Well, beside him, we have the waters. Well, we know the waters are darkness. We know that the waters are uh, transgression and night. We understand that it's outside of God. So who are the waters and who are the seas? They're being designated. And that's what we got to understand. The earth is being designated we're seeing a building constructed this is why if you read throughout scripture and we all talk about it right like jesus is the cornerstone that's yeah. this is we're built genesis is building a building this is another layer and you can actually read the temple uh go and look at the temple as we read this the temple of um so the tabernacle of moses the tabernacle of david the temple of solomon and the temple of herod all has this basic structure when you go through the front gate to the right would be the altar of sacrifice which was a big it's just a fire this is a step stone to a giant fire that's the dry land and on the left was this huge basin holding thousands and thousands of liters of water and what was it called it's literally designated the sea and then what do you get beyond that? So you have the below, you have the heaven, you have the earth and the sea. And as you proceed into the temple tabernacle itself through the gates past the, the sea and the dry land, you go into the temple and inside there is the tabernacle. That's where God is separated from everybody else. So we start seeing the designations and the order not only being established in the text, but physically being created on the land by the people who are writing this text. So we can't ignore the actual ordering of things in here. It's very important. That's point one. Is that, do you hear that? Yeah, I hear you. I think you made a great point with the division symbol. I'm stuck on that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, oh my gosh, that's great. So yes, I, yeah, following along. Can I just say one a little, or maybe a question about it? There's also, it's interesting that it uses the phrase, you know, to in one place. Um, I think that gives people a lot of trouble. I've heard, you know, people talk about, you know, maybe what underlies that symbolism is, you know, the Mediterranean, in the sense that that's the, you know, the biggest sea that they could think of. But I mean, if you, I think if you take it as, as Dallas has pointed out, in the temple, the basin was the sea, and it was all in one place. I mean, so, Dallas, do you have like sort of an understanding as to as to why it would need to be in one place, and what's being sort of you know indicated by that? Yeah, so a hundred percent. There's two really big messages, and this is where I start to unfold the narrative of Genesis one as a template and a narrative. So if you take what the Hebrews had to do, and if we take a look at history, so God is the waters above. So God is water. So that's the first thing we got to get into our head. The basin is filled with God. Okay, so that's done and done. We can't ignore that. Two, the peoples are the waters. Well, how does God use the peoples as judgment on the covenant people? They're always his weapon. It's other nations coming in and destroying people for punishment, taking uh, captives, all that kind of thing. So the water it is always used for, and how is it referred to by Peter, by Jesus? It's baptism. Eden was baptized in the flood. So that's God cleansing his covenant land with the nations. God loves the nations. He loves the peoples. He is the peoples. He wants to be with the peoples. And that's why he made a light of the world to draw the peoples. The problem is the peoples are in darkness. So that's the division. Is that, is that starting to kind of pull that together? Because once you walk through that front gate as a Hebrew under the law, and you see to the left, this big giant pillar of waters, that whole point that waters is even there is for the cleansing of the liturgy of the ceremonies of the temple. When you walked in, you as a Hebrew had to go and get washed up in that water. The temple uh, priesthood would wash with you and then they would deliver you over to the sacrifice where they would atone for your sins. And then you would stand and wait 
while the high priest would take your blood sacrifice into where only God was allowed to be for your atonement. So we actually see a process in that triangle. The waters was for cleansing, to make available the atonement for your sin, to make availability you to be present before God. I do, follow. if I might uh, jump in there, I, I just wanted to say what, I'm, what I see with this phrase in one place is I see as I'm following this narrative is God's sovereignty over this, what's happening. Uh, so uh, God's sovereign over the seas. He's sovereign over the placement of the seas. Uh, I would think of, uh, as we're going to journey further, Genesis 10, the table of the nations. You see this picture there of these seas that he's gathered, that he has placed. And then also in Acts chapter 17, uh, we see some allusion to that language about uh, what the Lord was sovereign over and how he created it in one place. The blood of the, the nations come from one man. I don't want to butcher that. Um, but uh, yeah, just I'm seeing a picture here of God's sovereignty over, again, if we're being consistent with what we're saying, we said that this is a picture of the old covenant, God's beginning work here. So he's sovereign over this work. He's sovereign over that separation, that division, if you will. And then as we move in on the new covenant, of course, we see he's sovereign over that beautiful picture that's happening as uh, now that there is going to be no more sea. Uh, and no more. So here's the question. Why is there the dry land? And now we're all talking about something that's in the temple walls. So yes, mm -hmm. they're all God's people that we're talking about. The sea is God's people and the atonement people are the same. So the dry land and the seas are in the temple walls. They're not outside. They're not foreigners yet, but they get applied later. <laughs> but in the tense of just the Hebrews and their original language, we have, well, what was the waters? Now, this is where it gets really important to understand because that's the darkness. Well, then what's the dry land? That's the light. So the people in darkness are those who have fallen out of covenant, have become lawless, are dim. They're dark. They need atonement. They need to be cleaned. So we get that information of the, that's why it's so important for us to understand. We have to go through the door then we have to go get baptized, cleaned, and made pure and right so that we could be made atoned. So that gives us a lot of information because that means that first group, as much as they're under God, they're with God, they've been removed from his presence. They're no longer, in, they were taken out of the temple, but then there's a further removal because there's the atoned people and the unatoned people. Hmm. Yes. I'm thinking of the land. I have to say this. I'm thinking of the land with the northern tribes, right? Where they were cast yes. off and dead to God. And then you had the, the southern tribes where God was. Beautiful. Now you're seeing the prophecy. Day two is the prophecy of the people separating themselves from Judah. Mm -hmm. seeing it's it. fascinating. They separated from God. The division, heaven, the temple. Hmm. Amen. Yeah, that's beautiful. Either you gentlemen have something you want to jump in and say? All right. Well, then I will, if you don't mind, I'll move us into verses 11 through 13, and we'll sort of stop there and uh, sum up. I know we're a little over our hour of power, but that's fine. Uh, hopefully, you're being blessed and edified by our time together. So let me go ahead and read to us verses 11 through 13, put them here on the screen. And this will be our third and final day in our discussion this morning. Then God said, let the earth sprout vegetation plants yielding seed and fruit trees on the, sorry, uh, the earth, bearing fruit or land, if we're going to properly look at that word there, arets, uh, bearing fruit after their kind with seeds in them. And it was so. The earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them after their kind. And God saw that it was good. There was evening and there was morning the third day. And here, uh, it was good. Amen. And let's just mark out plants, seeds, trees, fruit, you know, hindsight bias here. Uh, you know, you read into the New Testament, you see that language constantly being used about covenant. You know, you see, uh, you know, the, the planting of the Lord, the vineyard of the Lord, you see in the prophetic texts. Uh, you see seeds constantly referred to in covenant language. Uh, obviously, my mind goes to 1 Corinthians 15. <laughs> topic for another time uh you know tree we see this illusion constantly being used in, the, in scripture uh to talk about people to talk about people in covenant people outside of covenant trees being broken, branches being broken off and then fruit 
which I think would probably be the most easiest to get folks to realize that we're talking about covenant language there. Uh, we often talk about the fruit of the spirit uh, in our, our Christian lives. So um, for me, that's important. And then uh, after we exhaust some conversation, I might bring up some proof text that I further see uh, this language of uh, the earth bearing, you know, uh, fruit or um, excuse me, the uh, earth bearing ve vegetation, the trees bearing fruit and how I see that throughout the uh, scripture. So I'll share more, but I want to go ahead and open up for those of you that uh, have some thoughts on 11 through 13. Okay. I wanted to share <clears throat> how I believe that, you know, uh, Genesis is uh, covenant. I believe in covenant creation because, you know, God, God was doing, a, God is doing a work as far as, you know, with the seed and stuff like that, because it talks about uh, the, uh, the good soil uh, or, 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 or the, or the, uh, uh, the, the, the four, uh, what is it with, where, where the, uh, one is choked up by the, uh, thorns and then you have, you know, stony ground and what, 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 what is that verse, uh, considered, um, uh, with the stony ground and the parable good the soil. Sower. Yeah. The parable of the soul. Yes. This is what I'm thinking. The parable of the soul where God is doing the work, you know, where he has to provide you know, the good soil, you know, for it to, you know, receive the word and be fruitful and produce a hundredfold. It's God's work. And just uh, going off of, I mean, Edward's making a good connection because um, the, I mean, there's a direct connection between structurally between three and six and um you know that that connection of man and tree or plant you know is reiterated you know over and over throughout the the rest of the scriptures um and it starts here you know and um i do recommend there's a the Bible Project is a podcast we've talked about before. They've got a great series um, talking about the use of uh, trees and plants as metaphors um, or symbols in the scriptures. And yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, uh, Edward's making a great connection here. It also makes me think of that, <laughs> that there's a, there's a, um, the healing that Christ does in I think it's Mark of the blind man um, where, you know, he takes the, he takes the mud and puts it on his eyes. Um, and he does that two times. One, he removes the mud um, the first time and, or he, he, yeah, he begins the healing and asks the man, you know, what he can see. And he says he can see people um, or trees walking around. <laughs> and then he, uh, Christ, um, does the, finishes the healing and the man is um, healed from his blindness. But I think a lot of li liberal um, interpreters see that as some sort of, um, you know, failure on Christ's part. Like he couldn't, you know, complete the healing the first time he had to go back and do it a, a second time. But really it's, when you look at it within, you know, the biblical framework and the symbols that's being used in the Bible, this makes it makes perfect sense. Um, Christ has actually given him, you know, a vision through that first part of the healing to see into this symbolic covenantal world in a new way by like, seeing, you know, men as trees walking around. Um, but um, that's a little bit of a digression, but I guess that's what I think of when I see the Cool. I'm going to continue on in what you brought up in your last point, because I think it's really important to apply this to uh, day three, as if we were to take day one as the declaration of covenant, day two, the establishment of where God is to be and where the peoples are to be. Day three, now we have the earth, which was designated, and we have the waters, which were designated. So the waters below were now the night. They were darkness, they were separated, and we have the earth being designated as obviously the opposite of that, the light. 
and we'll get into day four and then we'll know that it's the light but as it sits right now they're the opposite of the darkness the light so this is the day now the earth is interesting because as you said if we were living in mesopotamia in the bay in the fertile crescent there depending on where we live and the comes and goes of the seasons we have we come out of a flood well what's the flood that's the depreciated state of genesis one then the wind is caused over the waters to recede causing dry land to appear so that's the flood waters coming down in spring then what now you have these pools of waters that are unmanageable and they're rotting out and they're full of feces and they're drying out and then you've got new fertile land appearing and out of the fertile land what are we getting we're getting vegetation we're getting the plants and the trees the earth is coming to life bringing fruit which is sustenance it's life so without that wind to move mesopotamia's uh, basin turning it from a bowl into a dry basin so to speak we see this natural progression in the eyes of the people and their cycles that they lived in in that time period now, when we take a look at that and go, okay, that's very prominent. Well, what is the grass? When we read this then, when God said that the earth bring forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, well, we're introduced to the legal concept of seeds. Why is that a big deal? Because we no longer live in an age that is created by procreating by the passing of a seed. That's done. That's an old covenant need. It's not a new covenant need. And it was established in the covenant template as the seed. So now what we also do is when we go on, well, is that we start adding, well, the earth, if that's the good place, if that's the place of the light, if that's order, if that's law, if that's God's presence, well, then that must mean the vegetation, these plants yielding seed must be of the kingdom. And the fruit trees on the earth are bringing forth life. And after their kind, and then it goes on to say that this is good. And what we're getting here is a primer. And if we take this language now, so what do we see in the creation of Adam? We have a dry land with nothing in the field, no bush, no grass. Then God causes it to rain. Then the waters come down. The baptism happens. Then what? Then the tree comes forth, bringing forth fruit. Well, that's, a, that's the covenant template of how God is establishing law and order amongst his new king, Adam. We see that exact same pattern with Noah, the exact same pattern with Moses. And the prophets pick it up. They say, man is like grass. And then what does it go? It says, God will breathe on the grass and make it a spirit-filled grass. Peter quotes that saying, when he says that all flesh is like grass and says that upon us now is the fulfillment of that promise. Then we read in Revelation, the judgment upon the covenant people. And what does it say? It says, let them, not, let them burn a third of the trees, a third of the grass. Why is it talking like that? Because this is now the new designation of the covenant people on the land being fruitful so that means day three in the prophetic building off of the natural adding in the legal we get representation of a fruitful grass-filled repeating seed-based system of the covenant people that's the earth and we even read god said called the dry land earth so going forward the heavens is where god is and the earth is now where his people are. So we've just had that defined for us in these days. Heavens above God, the earth below, his covenant, healthy, fruitful people established. And beside them, the people who reject that, who are lost in darkness and need atonement. And we have our structure of the universe according to the people under this covenant. So we get the original structure that was given to us by the Sumerians and the witnessing of the architecture of our natural world, the legal application that was put upon the people by Moses, the future prophecy of the coming of the Christ, and the need legally to represent that in scripture through the prophetic by representing the legal terminology defined in Genesis 1. So that's what I read in Genesis 3. 
or day three rather. Edward, you are muted. Oh, Thank yeah. You, Thank you, Pastor. Um, may I ask, am I far off by saying <clears throat> with the water, physical, the water coming down, watering the earth, you know, blessing it to produce and things of this nature, uh, the physical water and that and the baptism as you have spoke of. And I'm thinking the, the physical with the baptism of John, John the Baptist. And then now I'm thinking when you go spiritual, the spiritual baptism, the water, the water, the water of the word, the word being the water. And yes. the uh, being baptized in Jesus Christ, being immersed to the point of change through the gospel, through the word of God. You know, because physical water can't cause an individual to change, but the word of God can. Not to say, not to belittle any baptism today, you know, because I encourage baptism, but uh, water baptism, but I think mandatory is the baptism of Jesus Christ to be immersed in his word, you know, to, to change an individual into uh, an image of God, image of Christ. I think it's fascinating how you just tied the fulfillment of prophecy to the original needing meaning of water being Sumerian life. I think that connect what you just said connected that perfectly because without the Sumerian desperate need for water in their agriculture simply to sustain life, you must have been mindful of the things of water. Mm -hmm. So just like you said, we now must saturate ourselves with the light and the day of Christ so that we can be mindful of the water of his baptism. I think that's fantastic. Thank you. Amen. Yeah, I really appreciate Edward that you, you seem to have really picked up on and, and be, uh, you know, highlighting the prophetic nature of a lot of these, uh, these texts of what we're reading in Genesis one. So I, you know, and I, I had the privilege of course, of seeing you learn a lot of these details and study with you on these details. So, I'm just glad to see that you're connecting it and you're really seeing how that, you know, it broadens our understanding of what's going on in Genesis chapter one. So thank you. Amazing. We got through. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're getting there. It took a little longer than, you know, the hour, but hey, we're, we're getting there. Hey, I'm still learning to shut my mouth. If you, I've got <laughs> three, four weeks of videos and I haven't gotten out of Genesis one. So <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I get it. Jack, did you like you, I wake up. Ex oh, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, hey, go ahead. You finish your thought. I was just going to say, uh, just like you, I wake up excited thinking about this stuff because, and I don't mean to put this down, anyone down. This is not a detriment to where, if you're in a different place, but I feel sorry for futurists in the sense of the confusion, the, the emotions and the life that is caught up with it and trying to figure that out to move, like even moving in a partial credit, all that kind of stuff. Like, I feel sorry for them arguing against it because there's just no answers. And I feel with this, once you get it a little bit, it just becomes like this, just like preterism did. It just became a spider web and it just started growing and growing and everything connects and everything's right, but nobody's talking about it, but no one can prove it's wrong. And you're just stuck in this position where you're like, I know this is right. Please show me where I'm wrong. And I can't stop thinking about it because no one can show that it's wrong. And it makes the Bible make sense. Amen. Yeah, absolutely. Well said. You know, and I agree with you. I'm right there with you with the, you know, I haven't had anybody really try to prove me wrong. I think folks have said that I'm wrong, uh, but, you know, they haven't exactly uh, offered up any hermeneutics to help me see otherwise. Zach, did you have anything you wanted to jump in here and, and mention? Um. Not specifically. I mean, I'm just uh, I'm just very thankful for all of you who are participated and um, shared your thoughts. I mean, it's it's a lot to meditate on, um, and you know, I hope everybody out there is listening is is blessed by this. Um, I also would, you know, I I still want, um, or I still hope that maybe at some point um, we do a show on how to uh, how to inculcate this into the church how to, how to create this type of um 
yeah, this vision, this covenant vision that we're be, we've been given um, in Genesis and throughout the scriptures, how we how we get that into the church? Because I mean, there's there's a lot of people with a lot of different you know levels of understanding and um, you know different parts of their journey in understanding um, these views of Genesis and also with fulfilled eschatology. Um, and I, I think it would be, you know, beneficial and interesting to at some point, um, maybe after we've done all of this stuff to try to, you know, focus on like, how can we, people who are, I mean, we're, we're more immersed in this than other people, obviously, and not everybody's going to do the type of, um, you know, study on this, but is there a way for us to sort of communicate these things in, in, in the church and how we do church that would, you um, you know, help develop this type of vision and sense, um, yeah, in the church. In Blue Point Bible Church, where we have our Wednesday night Bible studies. We all need know. to go to a Blue Point Bible Church. <laughs> <laughs> we have uh, a time where, you know, we think through things and we have questions. And with the questions, everyone in the, in the room, you know, you know, state their view, their understanding, and they share where they are, you know, and, you know, what they've come to understand is truth. And then having that open dialogue and being able to conversate, you know, these things come out, you know, with questions and stuff, because the Bible says, you know, be, be ready to give an answer. You don't want to, you know, give them answers of things that they, that they had not asked, you know. So uh, you give them a venue where, they have that opportunity to ask the questions that's on their mind or where they're uncertain in certain areas of what was said or what they've learned. You know, they need a venue because there's a time and place for everything, basically, hopefully. Yeah, amen, amen. You know, I, I, I would encourage all to come to Blue Point Bible Church. <laughs> uh, however, I will say this in order to respond to that, Zach, and obviously, uh, let me just say this, and I think it further develops and it will be a conversation we will continue to have. Um, the first thing I would say is we need more books. I think writing of books is a good idea. Uh, I actually, I mentioned Gary DeMar on Monday. He's often said that to me. He said, you know, you want to get a view out, write more books about it. So uh, let's give a good shout out to Tim Martin and Jeff Vaughn for Beyond Creation Science, a great foundational resource. Uh, then I think publishing of more books, uh, creating of websites, YouTube channels, shout out to Dallas, of course, uh, better understanding the Bible there. I'm just going to plug because you said yeah. that I'm actually, this is my research for the book I'm writing on this. So fantastic. Here you go. Hey, look at that. There's, we already got another book coming. Um, you know, so uh, I think that's important. I think what Edward also, I wanted to highlight something Edward said about our Wednesday night Bible study. I think learning how to have these conversations with others in agreeable manners. For example, Ray Vanderlaan, he is not a preterist, a full preterist for that matter, uh, probably a partial preterist. We use his resources on Wednesday night, and he brings out a lot of these points. You know, we're like, man, he gets it. Uh, meanwhile, he might not be a part of covenant creation or full preterism. I say that because I think that's another thing we need to do is we need to work with other organizations that are saying similar things, highlighting, you know, uh, some of these ancient Near Eastern concepts, uh, you know, different points that we're seeing in Genesis and start leaning in on those resources, encouraging others to uh, pay attention to them. I know one resource that I've mentioned before, I don't agree with everything about the organization. However, uh, Bios Logos is a, a great organization that's really uh, tried to urge folks uh, toward understanding some of these things. Um, so, you know, I think those are some of my preliminary ideas I think that we need to be doing. Uh, conversations like this, uh, welcoming others for interviews, which we're hoping to do. And I believe each of us has a part in speaking to that exact uh, point that Zach was making there about how do we influence uh, this in, in the local church, in the broader church. And I think uh, each of us have different ways of doing that. Dallas is gonna write a book, he has his YouTube channel. Uh, I think each of us playing our part in some regard uh, will ultimately lead others to see the clarity of what we're saying here. So uh, that's what I, I hope that we are endeavoring toward and that we will continue to manifest. I'd also like to throw in there like uh, what Ed was talking about, uh, Edward was talking about, in that 
And I agree with you that a lot of people just don't get in depth in their study. So if we present uh, to them a lot of resources, like for me, that's gold. That's the way I learn. But I know uh, coming from a group that uh, that's not their goal. That's, they're not even in a place to study their own religion, let alone any information I bring up. So what I have found that a lot of people, it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one personal relationship based, getting to become comfortable so that I can express and this is where I agree with Edward, questions. Give people a safe place to express themselves because that in general doesn't happen. Build that foundation and then ask questions and help lead through questions because we live in a world now where everybody seems to have an answer and nobody wants to listen. And I don't think that's even a good way of doing it anyway. Preaching is only a, a, a valuable thing when someone's wanting the information you're saying and we're approaching people who, one, probably don't want it, probably aren't aware of it, are probably scared of it. There's a whole bunch of things that we have to address that prevents the mentality of an individual from hearing it, let alone the doctrine. So what I would say is it has to be a relationship. Well, this is, it's love. We have to meet everyone where they're going to be indifferent and accept them, like Edward is saying. Let them say where they're at. Let them be right. Let them be wrong. It doesn't matter. What matters is, and I'm going to preach now on what Mike has said, it's the spirit. If they want to come and sit down, have time with you, and not be divisive. One thing I have learned is, if you take my parable, <laughs> I walk through the world as though it's a field of corn. I take a stalk, I pull the ear back, and I look at it. If it's unripe, I fold it back up, and I keep walking. And I stop at the next one, I pull it down. If, it's, if that ear of corn is ready to hear, I'll stand and preach. But that's the individual basis. I like what Edward said. Do it in your church in a small group of comfortable people who then now can speak the truth and have a place of safety. And then move on to Mike. Okay, you're ready. Here's some resources. And I think any stage can be developed at any time. But if, it has to be based upon the comfortability and the safety of the people you want to receive your message. Yes. Well said. Amen. And like from the Saturday Saturday morning Bible study, there was a, <clears throat> a time where there was an individual in one of the teachings that had said, you know, uh, you want to talk to an individual individually to, to where they are personally, because everyone is at a different place, have, you know, have the different measure of faith or however. Yeah. And uh, you want to be able to answer them and talk to them where they are in who they are and how they are. Because like, according to Paul, Paul said, you know, uh, to the Greek, I'll be a Greek. And you know how the scripture goes, you know? So an individual, you know, has their individual need, you know? So they have their questions and you want to be able to talk to them because you can't talk to them in a general form, you know, like you would talk to, it, to any and everybody, you know, everyone may need a specific, you know, care. Yes, deal with individuals as individuals. Amen. Uh, I want to go ahead and just uh, conclude our time. Uh, you know, I, I think we've uh, exhausted a lot of uh, good thoughts here about Genesis chapters one through third. Uh, Genesis chapter one, verses one through thirteen. And uh, if I might just share some verses, and then I want to make sure I give everybody that opportunity to end on uh, what we're talking about here. If you feel you haven't exhausted your thoughts, but uh, just to speak to what we read there about the earth sprouting vegetation, the plant seeds trees, fruit language. Uh, and I appreciate, you know, the thoughts that all of you shared, uh, definitely Edward bringing us to the parable of the sower, Thought that was very, uh, you know, mindful there. And, um, you know, men walking as trees, man is like grass, you know, all of us kind of contribute some great points to that. Uh, I just wanted to bring up a couple verses that came to mind for me. One would be Isaiah chapter one, verses one through three. And again, it's just noting the similarity of language and how it's being used by the prophets, really, uh, you know, taking in what Dallas has marked out there about the way the prophets use uh, this language that we're finding in the law. And if you read uh, Isaiah 1, 1 through 3, I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. It says this, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos concerning Judah and Jerusalem, which he saw during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Listen, O heavens, and hear, O earth, for the Lord speaks. Sons I have reared and brought up, but they have revolted against me. An ox knows its owner, and a donkey its, ma its master's manger, but Israel does not know. My people do not 
understand. I think that weighs in on a lot of what we talked about this morning about the divisions we saw there about the division and then the, the uh, those that were going to go into darkness uh, ultimately of the northern tribes. So you see that language uh, constantly being asserted by the prophets. And then another text that really stood out to me uh, using similar language and making a similar point would be Jeremiah chapter five. In Jeremiah five, I'm just gonna read verses 24 to 25. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Lord our God who gives rain in its season, both the autumn rain and the spring rain, who keeps for us the appointed weeks of the harvest. Your iniquities have turned these away and your sins have withheld good from you. There you see more about that waters that come from the Lord and uh, you know just some beautiful imagery. So I'm hoping that you'll continue to do the studying, the mining of the scriptures, if you will, and seeing how this language that we're finding right here in Genesis chapter one is used all throughout the biblical uh, story there and how it opens up what we're talking about here, this covenant story, old covenant, new covenant, you know, prophetic picture to Jesus Christ and, uh, you know, so much more. So I hope that you're seeing that, that you're being encouraged to do the study. And uh, I think, of course, the minds and hearts that are gathered here with us uh, this morning. So any of you want to just say anything before I kind of roll into some announcements, resources and close out the program? Last yeah, thought, just, oh, go share. ahead, go ahead. Last thought, uh, to get Genesis right, from the start uh, through programs like this and other resources to get the uh, to get Genesis right, you would have a better reading of scripture because it's all connecting. It's, it's, it's a fluid, uh, from Genesis through Revelation, it's a fluid flow of truth uh, connecting. So if you get the beginning right, you should get the end correct. That was perfect lead up because I just have a scripture I want to, <laughs> read in consideration to the information we put out today and that's exactly to what edward was saying how it flows out of genesis and we're going to read in isaiah 44 uh, verse 1 and uh, we'll just stop here probably at verse 4 it looks like so isaiah 44 1 through 4 but now hero jacob my servant israel whom i have chosen thus says the lord who made you who formed you from the womb, formed. For Fear not, Jacob, my servant, Jeshuan, whom I have chosen, for I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. Mm -hmm preaching the gospel over here this morning. Look at <laughs> Men. <laughs> but that was only possible because of the covenant template of Genesis 1. Otherwise, those words are meaningless. Right. Yeah, it informs us a lot. And I see the grass imagery there. I'm going to be diving in on that. I imagine we've said a lot here. So, you know, I'm hoping that folks that are listening aren't you know, being confused, but rather saying, wow, that opens up an area of study that I need to look into. That's something, like I said, and I've shared here, that's something the Lord has done in my life more recently where I've been opened up to, you know, yeah, I think that, you know, there's something to follow, a thread to follow here. And uh, hopefully you're being encouraged in that same way. So uh, thank you for, you know, that text, Dallas, and thank each of you again for your, your minds and your hearts to be here with me for this time this morning. I'm going to go ahead and close us out. Uh, this has been our two hour, hour of power, midweek, uh, double hour of power, if you will. And uh, just to kind of close out and share some thoughts, uh, we had Stacy Turbyville, found out how to pronounce his last name uh, on um, Monday. So Stacy Turbyville joined with us on Monday in the afternoon, and we were able to have some great discussion with him about his debate, recent debate with Sam Frost and uh, his hopeful debates in the future. So uh, please put some prayer behind that. Uh, there will be a resource available for you. Uh, probably tomorrow uh, at powerofpreterism.wordpress.com where, where you'll be able to get the YouTube link for the Stacey Turbyville interview, as well as a host of resources that we mentioned, including but not limited to his debate with Sam Frost, as well as some of my debates with Sam Frost. So uh, we'll have those resources for you. Uh, I do want to put some prayers behind and appreciate Dr. Lynn Hiles. That man is on fire. He is on the move, preaching all over the United States. I believe he just went from Texas, from Virginia to Texas, no, I'm sorry, from Missouri to Virginia, from Virginia to Texas, back to Virginia. And he's going somewhere else now. I think he's going down south or something. I mean, the man is 
just on the move. And if you followed his teachings, he is a you know fulfilled teacher, kingdom, you know, power, kingdom now, and uh, really doing some great work. So uh, I mentioned the Stacey Turbyville uh, link. Also, you know, I'm working on a uh, debate review. It'll be the TPPN, the Power of Preterism Network debate review, uh, which will catalog different debates and then our review of them on one running resource that is soon to come. And then also, uh, I do want to appreciate Gary DeMar. I mentioned him on Monday, and uh, I just noticed uh, if you're on Facebook, you can notice he's starting some conversation with folks about preterism, uh, highlighting the problems with dispensationalists and even some partial preterists that bring up points against full preterism. And uh, I appreciate what Gary's doing there. It seems as though he's on a, uh, you know, a very powerful work of God. You know, the spirit is hovering, so to speak. And uh, I'm just very grateful for that. And then uh, I did mention, we'll have interview with Dallas Monday morning. Uh, so we want you to join with us on Friday, of course, at 1030 as we conclude Genesis 1. However, you can also look forward to next Monday where we're gonna have Dallas join with us from Better Understanding the Bible. And uh, he'll be with us uh, to share his testimony, to share some uh, thoughts in regards to why he's been blessed or why he believes Genesis is important to understand and how he's been blessed with some of these great insights that he's blessed us with. I did want to go ahead and close out. Uh, now you know, Dallas is working on a book. Now we all know. Uh, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for that and uh, definitely encourage folks to get their hands on that. I did want to mention some things I, I said this morning on social media. Um, one was a response to a post a friend had made. He said, we are not saved so that we can die and go to a place called heaven someday in the sweet by and by. We are saved, then translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light, kingdom of God. Unfortunately, none of us have been taught about the kingdom, how the kingdom of God operates. That should dismay us that somebody would say that uh, within the Christian community. So my response to that was, great point. This is exactly why I will be publishing Kingdom Kings in October 2023, a contextual and applicational look at the King's Corpus, which is first and second Kings in your Bible. So you can look forward to that. About a year from now, that resource will come out and prayerfully it'll further encourage us in how the kingdom of God operates uh, through us, in us, and with us. And uh, that's something that you could look forward to. And then of course, I've mentioned I'm working on a book that I wanted to publish by the end of this year. You could still keep that in prayer. However, it's looking like it's going to be early next year. Uh, that's going to be Full Preterism, Proclaiming the Presence and Purpose of God. And uh, I wrote here in my notes, it's coming soon, but no man knows the day or the hour. So uh, I'm working on that and uh, we're, we're going to get that done. Uh, so again, thank you for being here with me. I pray that this these hours of power, if you will, were a blessing to you. Uh, we've marked out some great things. We're going to move in on days four through seven on Friday morning. So join with us at 1030 a.m. Eastern and be blessed by our discussion then. Let's go ahead and just close out with a word of prayer. And I pray the rest of you, uh, the rest of your day will be as blessed as those of you that have come together this morning with me have blessed my day. Mighty God, you are truly a faithful, blessed, merciful, glorious God. You bless us with this light, Lord, that we can praise you, uh, that we can see your work in the midst of the grass, and uh, Lord, that we can uh, proclaim the, the waters of life, Lord, and, and, and offer that to others and tell them to come and drink of these waters, Lord, drink of you and all that you've provided. Lord, I thank you for this imagery that we're seeing in Genesis 1. I thank you for the clarity, the complexity, and the further study that these things mark out. Lord, be glorified in our time. Pray, receive all the praise for anything that we've come to understand. We thank you, Lord. And of course, we thank you for each other, the fellowship that we share, and we pray you will continue to be with us as we study to show ourselves approved, rightly dividing the word of truth. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless and go in peace and I'll see you on Friday morning.